Okay, hopefully a little bit of a faster video today, friend those, but I just saw Mortal Kombat and I just, I have, I wanna have a chit chat. It's actually a lie, I saw it yesterday, but I just, I didn't end up recording this yesterday. But let's get some things out of the way. Am I a Mortal Kombat expert? No. Do I know a little something something or a lot of bit about certain characters? Yes. Do I know absolutely nothing about others? Also, yes. I remember my parents having some of the games on Super Nintendo and not having any idea that there was supposed to be any kind of lore around it. I just picked characters that I thought looked cool and I wasn't even supposed to be playing the games as a child, but it didn't matter because I sucked ass. Anyways, I just, you know, went back and forth between Scorpion and Sub-Zero until somebody unlocked Reptile and I picked him all the time because green was my favorite color. And that's like, that's what being a kid was about. Just picking the one that looked the coolest. Not so much a fan of him the further we get into the games, but it's, it's whatever. But years later, Mortal Kombat would become near and dear to my heart. After a really bad breakup, I remember spending an entire summer playing Mortal Kombat 9, like the 2011 reboot with my friends, eating pizza, just chilling, living life. And I still sucked at it. I'm a button masher, what can I say? I get that one thing down and that's all I do. But we'd go through all the different character backgrounds and how the story changed for the new era. Again, mostly the cool characters like Sub-Zero and Scorpion. So I've got a soft spot for a lot of Mortal Kombat. And that brings us to this movie. Some people are really upset. And I'm not saying that that's not valid and that you have to like this movie and there's something wrong with you if you didn't like this movie, but it seems like some people were expecting some kind of like Academy front runner or something or award-winning movie. Guys, it's about a death match tournament. It's only gonna get so deep. And that's not to say that it can't get deep. And there are moments in this that do get deep. And if the entire movie had been like shaped around that, it could have also been badass. But I saw some people saying that it was unwatched which like, come on. <laughs> Look, I make it through a ton of stuff that's deemed unwatchable trash. So I consider myself like almost an expert on this. And I can firmly place this in the realm of watchable and even fun if you're down for the ride. Maybe it's wrong to go into a movie expecting it to be some kind of like cheesy schlock, but I don't know, it's Mortal Kombat. I was looking for some good vibes and I got them. The way I will say that seeing the negative reviews roll out over the past few days probably helped frame myself going into this movie. Cause like, I remember being really excited by the trailer, but then like, negative or mediocre reviews were like, okay, let's just reframe expectations. And then you go into it and you're like, wow, this is surprisingly fun. It's flawed, but neat. That's pretty neat. Cause I hadn't kept up with any of the promotional stuff. Like I watched the trailer and I was like, you know what? I'm not typically a fan of just straight up action movies, but this looks fun. Like for me, all it took was the scene with the ice gun and I, I was sold. <laughs> And again, I'm not saying that this is perfect or some amazing experience. I gave it a three on Letterboxd. It had a ton of like two star, maybe a little under moments. And it had a lot of really great like four star moments. So I think a three is a fair rating when we take into account the fun factor. If I'm just looking at the movie alone, like it's probably like a two and a half, but just taking in everything, the excitement, I'm giving, I'm a, it's a firm three for me. And maybe if I ever get a chance to watch it with a group of friends, it might go up. Now this isn't the first live action Mortal Kombat outing. There's the icon campy classic Mortal Kombat from 1995. It's horrendously hilarious sequel Mortal Kombat Annihilation that killed the trilogy in the water. Mortal Kombat Legacy, which I seem to remember being pretty good considering it was just kind of like a series of shorts. And holy shit, I just remember the Conquest TV show. That was, that was a thing, right? Right before the turn of the millennium. The 90s were a great time. And now we have Mortal Kombat 2021. And while it's not perfect, I had a ton of fun at this, if you couldn't already tell. This isn't a great movie, hell. I don't even know if this is a good movie, but I'll be damned if I didn't have a great time watching it. I wish I had been watching this in a theater with that exact same group of pals I used to play games with all those summers ago. I want a basement Mortal Kombat party. I want to rent out a movie, th I should rent out a movie theater. It's probably not something that I'm gonna go out of my way to rewatch, but I would 100% watch it with a group of friends. And I'm like craving the experience of watching it with a group of friends. And as I mentioned, straight up action movies are typically my least favorite type of movie. With this as an experience, like Flash Gordon. Oh my God, I want Flash Gordon in Mortal Kombat. Flash. Oh. And other than it just being a solid time, I think there's a lot of things they got really right. I think the music, how they managed to blend some of the old tunes in with it was like really well handled. I think a lot of the score was really great. It has a lot of really great humor and quips, which may annoy some people, but Mortal Kombat has a lot of 
quips, it's people fighting in a tournament death match, and some of them are going to be that way, and some of them are going to be super serious. I feel like the movie handled that pretty well. And it doesn't make anybody that you'd expect to be serious a joke. Like, yes, there are some things that aren't intentionally as cheesy as, like, the moments where you can tell they're steering into the cheese, and then it just... Un I don't know, sometimes when Raiden looks up at the screen and you just see the glowing eyes, you're like, ah a film school project. <laughs> but I really just feel like they played off the characters' natural personalities and that all came through really strong on screen. But it does obviously have its issues. For a movie with a bunch of martial arts professionals, it's odd that they use so many different like quick cuts in the fighting scenes. I'm usually more okay with quick cut editing and fight scenes in movies than a lot of other people seem to be, but like something like this specifically where you have people like Joe Taslam from The Raid, like what are you doing? I will say that the fight scenes involving him tended to be a lot stronger than some of the other ones, but you have a a lot of people who are actually martial arts professionals and you're not letting that natural flow uh, flow. Not that Joe Taslam wasn't great as Sub-Zero, because he was. I also feel like they overdid some of the training scenes in the movie so that it took away time from some of the other fights, because that's like one of my other complaints is that at points it just starts feeling really rushed along in areas where it shouldn't. I know I always say when it comes to anime, I'm like really sick of like the training school trope. It's like I feel like I got it out of my system with Naruto and then everybody starts doing it. Like I, I was kind of really into My Hero Academia and then like it started the training arc and I just never got past that. Maybe I'll go back and I, I know it's good and I know it gets outside that, but I was like, I'm good. <laughs> Again, now that there weren't some good moments in those training scenes. Let's see it go down again. But I would have taken less on that side of things so that they could like amp up some of the, the later fights a little bit more. And also for this being rated R, it's not really as bloody or as violent as it could have been. Like, yes, there are some very brutal fatalities and finishing moves in this, but I'm just saying that if you have an R rating, like use the R rating. Like I'm pretty sure they had somebody from Kill Bill involved in this. Like they really could have done some cool shit. But of all the flaws, sadly, I think it's our main character that struggles the most. A lot of that is down to the cheesy dialogue that he has to give, but a lot of it's just the way he delivers that bad dialogue. Not everyone is Ewan McGregor, you know, some people just can't make it work. And that's not to say that I'm not into the cheesiness of this movie because I absolutely am, it's just sometimes the performance felt like unintentional, bad, cheesy, not intentional cheesy. But a lot of people just have issues with this character in general. I'm not completely opposed to what they were trying to do here, which I'll get into later. I just wish they had done it better. And if you were someone who really kept up with the promotional material surrounding this, where apparently they were just super pushing the Scorpion versus Sub-Zero because obviously it's a Mortal Kombat movie and I, yeah, I know that's why they would do that, but I also see why you would be let down. I will say that what we get of those two characters is amazing. And even though I like the cheesy, campy, funny schlock stuff that's kind of in between, I would have gladly taken an entire movie with the same tone and just vibe of the opening scene. Hideyuki Sonata just kills it with this role. If you can watch The Twilight Samurai, I'd strongly recommend it and you might recognize him from The Wolverine too. But I guess that leads us into the movie itself and what they were trying to do with it story-wise. The general premise is that Cole here, unaware of his legacy, was born with a dragon to, I mean, birthmark, securing him a spot in Mortal Kombat. I don't know how serious people were expecting this to get. So in this iteration of the story, people are selected to be part of Mortal Kombat with these dragon marks. And if you don't get it at birth, you can get it by killing somebody who does have the mark. So the mark's like an invitation, and if you don't have one, you can't compete. But before all of this, we start off in 17th century Japan. And like I mentioned, this is absolutely the coolest scene of the movie. In a lot of ways, it feels like they just kind of blew their load in the intro, but there's a lot of good stuff in this to keep you watching. It's a fun ride. But in that first scene, we get the idyllic family life of Hanzo Hasashi, aka Scorpion, but not yet. Before the Lingue assassins show up to murder members of Hanzo's family, before Bihan, aka Sub-Zero, but not yet, kills Hanzo's wife and son. And this was just such a hauntingly brutal image for this man to walk back on. His wife holding their son, the blood exploding out of her back, frozen in place like the rest of her, amazing. And after quickly taking out the other soldiers, Hanzo gets into a fight with Bihan, gets stabbed before being taken to the nether realm in a swirl of fire. Bihan believes he just killed off the bloodline, but Raiden shows up not long after and finds Hanzo's daughter hidden in the house. And that leads us to present day with Cole. Oh, Cole. No shades of Lewis Tan, but a lot of his performance is very weak. We find out that he's a bit of a washed up MMA fighter and has this dragon birthmark, so what should immediately be obvious is that this is a descendant of Hanzo Hasashi. And for those familiar with the games, you know that Cole is not 
from them. He seems to be the type of character that's around to be an audience proxy so that like when he's learning things, we're learning things, but in a lot of situations, the audience is gonna have a better idea of what's going on than him. I also don't think he's feeling in a role that couldn't have been achieved by a different character. And a lot of this is just gonna come down to the writing. He unfortunately gets most of the, come on gang, we can do it type lines that are always typically quite cheesy. And he really does end up feeling like a fan fiction self-insert character. Like I like the idea of a scorpion bloodline and a descendant from that family line, but maybe just not the way they did it here. Like this could have been a character that had some kind of like brutal generational revenge plot, but I don't know, it's it's fine. I get what they were going for, I, I don't know. But thankfully there are other characters that come in and make up for things in the personality department. <laughs> After getting his ass handed to him, Jack shows up and randomly starts asking him questions about the dragon and starts following him around. And fans of the series may be acutely aware that Jack still has his arms, so something's gonna happen to those. And while Cole is getting food with his family, it spontaneously starts to snow outside. Uh-oh. Now this could have been way more brutal than it actually was, but Jax gets them out pretty soon. And he explains, hey, I've got one of those marks too. It means you were chosen. Chosen for what exactly? Well, to fight. I'm not the fighter that I used to be, okay? No shit. His family's great though. Kids acting circles around him. Before they can make it out, Sub-Zero catches up with them and to give Cole a chance to escape and find Sonya Blade, he decides to hunt down Sub-Zero on his own. And it goes about as well as you would expect. Yeah, there they go. But Cole makes it to Sonya who tells him about a great death match tournament called Mortal Kombat. <laughs> it just kind of sounds like you made it up. I mean, and look, they spelled it wrong. Hey, and how there's different realms and species that are represented by these chosen champions. Eventually it's revealed that the Outworld Realm only needs one more victory in Mortal Kombat to be able to take over the Earth Realm. And to stack the odds in his favor, Shang Tsung is basically hunting down anyone they can find with the mark. Then, a 10 out of 10 character in this movie is introduced, Kano. Oh, hello, sunshine. Typically it would be annoying to have somebody showboating this much in a movie, but it it's an absolute delight. But before Sonya can explain more, Reptile shows up. Not a huge fan on this version, but it made for a badass fight where Kano sticks it with a flare and punches its art out. Kano wins. <laughs> you fucking beauty. <laughs> Look, if you're gonna do it, commit and commit this movie does. It's hard to believe that this is happening in the same universe as the intro of this movie, but I'm having fun. After this, they go to find Raiden's temple to train and meet the other Earthrealm champions, Liu Kang and Kung Lao, and Liu Kang is jazzed. He's so stoked that this ragtag group of individuals is gonna be able to pull it off and save the Earthrealm. Hell, he even tracked down Armless Jax and then gives him these little itty bitty mechanical arms. Now, one of the bigger introductions to the mythos here is that characters get their powers from something called Arcana. So Liu Kang wasn't born with the ability to launch fireballs out of his fists, he had to unlock it. Okay, that's far enough, MC Hammer. And I know a lot of Mortal Kombat fans seem to be having an issue with this in general. Some people also really don't like that you had to be selected to compete with one of these marks, but I thought it worked really well for the story that they were establishing. But it's a bit of a challenge to unlock this Arcana stuff. They start training, mostly getting their asses kicked. That the only move you know, mate. Ah, oh, fuck. God, it's like I'm playing. Find your move and stick with it. Where's Raiden with his torpedo move? And the Liu Kang has hope, Raiden has none. A washed up fighter, a scummy mercenary, someone who lost their arms and someone who wasn't even a selected champion. Where's your marking? I don't have one. They only managed to get Kanos to pop off by insulting him and calling him a weak little failure bitch. Shut up and pass me up, Negro! 10 out of 10. But Cole isn't so lucky. Raiden ends up filling him in on his lineage, leaning all the way back to Hisashi, but too bad, bloodline's weak now. Cole sucks and gets to go back to his family. Then Shang Tsung finds out a way around Raiden's defenses. I think I can help. Did you see a guy down there? Complete an asshole. You're gonna love him. See, Cabal knows Kano. He's only in his current state because of Kano, which means he also knows the way to get to Kano, money. I would take an entire movie about these two and like their other ragtag group of mercenaries. So while Cabal goes to get the defenses down, Goro goes to find Cole. And after his wife steps up to the plate and axes the mother Cole is finally able to unleash his power and it's some kind of bodysuit and tomfa blades. I, I remember somebody saying that he got his plot armor with, with little li literal armor. <laughs> 
I was really hoping he would take on the spirit of Scorpion or something like that could have been so badass. Either way, he brutalizes Goro, heads back to the temple where, surprise, this was Raiden's plan all along. Put his family in mortal danger and that Arcana will pop right out. And back at the temple, there's this pretty big battle going on where we get what had to be the best flawless victory fatality with Kung Lao setting up his helmet like a bench saw and just running Tara through it. Flawless victory. Then Jax's Arcana develops and grows his little robotic arms into big boy robotic arms, so he is down to party. But sadly, before Raiden can zap him all to safety, Shang Tsung sucks out Kung Lao's soul. Brutal. It's here that Cole has the great idea. They want a tournament? Let's make a bunch of separated mini tournaments. And this is where a cheesy line delivery hits its peak. It's not over. We still need to fight. So Raiden gives Cole the kunai that Hanzo was killed with and says that if he uses it, Hanzo's spirit will fight with him. It's from here that I can understand why things would feel a little bit rushed. Jax fights for a couple seconds, then clap explodes Reiko's head. Yeah, these motherfuckers work. I do really love the fight between Kano and Sonya though. It's all confined to this house, but it honestly works. And Kung Lao's dragon finisher on Cabal is super dope and he also does the spam flying kick, which I for one feel seen. Actually, no, I feel more like Cabal because I, I'm usually on the receiving end of the... But we're supposed to believe that Cole can triumph over Sub-Zero when he can't even take out Melina? Like, Melina's a badass, but like, you know, Sonya has to come in with a hard assist. Which brings us to that epic battle. Sub-Zero has stolen Cole's family and brought them to the gym that he competes with, and then they froze them, so I assume them to be quite dead. But just before he can finish off Cole and end the Hasashi bloodline, Hanzo rises from the nether realm. Get over here! Commit! To the bit. This man hasn't said anything not in Japanese the entire movie and will continue not to say anything other than in Japanese for the remainder of the movie. But he can whip out a get over here? I love it. And we finally get Scorpion. <laughs> this fight is great. Start with the best, end with the best. I totally understand why you would want an entire movie about these two kind of like just revenge plot. I'm okay with all the fun stuff in the middle for this badassery. This scene is going to show you a bunch of the moves that you love to see. You get the blood spear from Sub-Zero, the ice duplicates. But somehow Cole's family are not dead. Scorpion unfreezes them and they're fine. I don't know if it's because it's magic hellfire or some shit, but okay, GG Cole. And after a brutal fight where Scorpion is empowered with the memories of what Sub-Zero did to his family, he burns the bejesus out of him. This of course will make way for the rise of Noob Saibot in the sequel that I'm hoping that we're actually gonna get. I'm stoked for Noob Saibot. Also, Hanzo just speaks to Cole in Japanese and he just seems to understand it, even though I don't think that he speaks Japanese. But you know, I guess he seems to get the gist of things. Then it ends with what has to be one of my favorite end offs with Cole saying he's going to Hollywood to find somebody. And it ends with a poster of Johnny Cage, baby. Is it mechanically possible for you to fuck yourself? I'm taking you out and I'm taking you out for dinner. Yeah, the tournament didn't even happen in this and that's okay, build up to the epic tournament. The real tournament are the spinal injuries we got along the way. But that's basically it for Mortal Kombat. I feel like if you know what you're getting into, you should probably have a good time. Like don't go in expecting a work of art or something that's gonna stay super serious and grounded the entire time. I personally feel like this is the best live action Mortal Kombat movie we've ever gotten. I guess, depending on how much insane ridiculousness you like. I know a lot of people are like, no, Annihilation is the best because it is the worst. But let me know what you guys are thinking down below. Again, I know a lot of people didn't like this and I'm not trying to like ruin your opinions. I just do feel like some people are being a little bit too hard on this and that's totally okay. If you feel like this kind of ruined your perception of Mortal Kombat lore or something, that's totally fine. I just personally had a really great time with this. I'm strongly considering renting out a theater in my hometown and like bringing a handful of friends to watch this thing, which is stupid, but like it's, it's a simple joy. And if, it, if this is something that makes you happy, I'm not gonna feel bad for this being fun and blah. And that means you also don't have to feel bad for it not being what you wanted it to be. That's totally okay. I just think people are being a little bit too hard on it. And I gave it a very average three out of five star rating. And that's gonna do it for today's video. Thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay. And we'll catch you all later.